Okay, hello, uh, hello everybody, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Will Condensi, Vice President here at uh, OCLC. Very pleased to see uh, uh, people here uh, in the room in uh, Dublin, and also we have uh, participants coming in uh, over the network. Uh, we're here um, this morning in Dublin, and at other time in other places, to hear uh, Kurt de Belder, a university librarian at Leiden University, talk about the transformation of the uh, academic library. Uh, Kurt is, uh, well, the first thing to say about him is that he has mastered his uh, online identity. Um, so uh, those of you who have looked at his bio will find a, a very nice um, uh, kbelder.home uh, place on the web where uh, everything you want to know about Kurt is, uh, is nicely um, lodged. Um, uh, and when you search for him, this, uh, this comes up. So he's uh, controlling his, uh, his network presence. Uh, a very full uh, bio is there, so I, I won't um, uh, go through it at length. But I think it is worth noting, uh, especially uh, for uh, this audience, that uh, Kurt uh, lived for 12 years in the US. He's originally Belgian, uh, lived for 12 years in the US, graduate school in uh, Berkeley, and then worked in uh, Berkeley, Stanford, and New York University. Then returned uh, to Europe, but to the Netherlands, um, uh, where he worked at Amsterdam. He's now, uh, as I say, a university librarian at uh, Leiden. Uh, Leiden, a major uh, research library within uh, Netherlands and European context. So Kurt is very uh, active, has a rich experience, but is also very active in uh, thinking about transformation of the academic library, very active in uh, a range of uh, uh, institutional professional uh, forums. Um, I would uh, highlight that he is a board member of CLEAR, so he's here in the US to talk to us, but also um, to attend his uh, first board meeting of uh, CLEAR. Um, something of a, of a US focus there, but also a global interest. Um, he's a member of the executive board of uh, LIBER. LIBER is an organization that brings together research libraries in Europe um, to think about their um, collective future. And also, um, he's a member of the steering committee of the National Information Infrastructure Consortium in the Netherlands. Um, uh, this is very important from a, an OCLC point of view. OCLC, uh, as people know, very involved in um, um, providing uh, national bibliographic infrastructure uh, in the Netherlands and has a close um, connection with um, um, Dutch uh, universities and other libraries in that context. So I'm very pleased um, to ask uh, Kurt to talk to us about the transformation of the academic library. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lorcan. Um, um, I'm very glad to be here, and thank you very much uh, to OCLC for the invitation. Um, I, I'd like to start with a quote that you will all um, recognize, and uh, yeah, let me. Um, and that's, of course, the Ram Emanuel quote, um, which is already a number of years old, about you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. Um, you can doubt about that if uh, a serious crisis has not gone to waste in the financial world, uh, whether the necessary uh, measures have been taken. But I do believe that we are also in a uh, situation as research libraries where we do really do need to think uh, about the types of actions we need to make because our world is changing is changing drastically. And uh, yeah, and um, my talk will um, will be will focus on some of the things we've been doing in Leiden but also at other, at other uh, university libraries, and where we look at the things, uh, how things will evolve, at least from my perspective, and the things we want to, look, to pick up, and what kind of challenges uh, those, uh, those endeavors uh, pose. Um, um, so, um, yes, so the, uh, there are a number of disruptive elements that are facing us right now, and um, the um, the uh, Google search, Google Books, uh, these are of course all of the, uh, the, the, the elements that we, that we know of that are, are really changing the, um, the, the life of our researchers, of our, of our students, and where um, uh, we are trying to adapt to that new, new type of situation. Uh, yeah, 
information is really uh, uh, is, has, is, is digital. Um, paper information uh, is uh, lost uh, its importance, um, and uh, but we also notice that uh, that information has become much more pluriform. Uh, we're not just talking about uh, books and articles any longer. We're talking about research data. We're talking about nano publications where uh, you basically have RDF triples uh, that, you, that are, are being stored and where uh, the information is really being used not just to, uh, uh, as a, uh, through a human uh, interface but as, as computer computational information that is used uh, by uh, computers in order to do uh, that type of research. So that the... the the, the way information is being used, to, the format of the information is also changing, changing quite rapidly. Um, obviously, mobile technology, uh, nothing new about that. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, what I think is, uh, is more important also is also the changes that are happening in science and, and in scholarship. Uh, we do notice um, that uh, the kind of models that we had in the exact sciences uh, are also moving in towards social sciences and humanities. And that means it's much more collaborative work. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the idea of a uh, researcher um, on his own or her own in a library uh, doing research for a number of years, uh, that it still happens, but that is not the typical, uh, the typical way uh, in which uh, research happens uh, any longer or uh, happens. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's more collaborative. It's also more programmatic. Um, so quite often it's the, uh, the funder that's going to uh, uh, introduce the program, the research program, uh, where uh, researchers will um, uh, fall into that. Um, and it's more data focused, uh, as I already mentioned, um, uh, also in humanities where, uh, in fact, that where we really have a challenge of having an enormous diversity of types of data uh, that are, are, are being used. Um, and of course, uh, what we do see, and it's, uh, it's, it's in the uptake, it not, has not had a, a huge impact yet, but I think it's, it's really starting off, it's the whole e-science, e-humanities, e-research, however you want to call it, um, uh, uh, where we're using a variety of uh, different um, uh, services, data from all over, the, all over the world, and bring those together and, uh, and, and do research. And where, again, as a library, as a library services, where do we fit in in all of this? Uh, so uh, this is also a an, an very known picture by Jim Gray, this, the different science paradigms. Um, all of these paradigms are still, of course, in existence. It's uh, there's still empirical science being done and so on and so forth. But obviously the, the, the idea is that uh, uh, data exploration, um, computational humanities, computational social sciences are, uh, are really taking off. And we see uh, in the Netherlands but in other uh, uh, countries also uh, organizations starting up uh, where, um, uh, where they're really focusing on, on data research and where they're bringing um, a combination of data scientists, uh, uh, humanities researchers, and, and, uh, and develop tools in order to do uh, this type of work. That, of course, um, also changes a lot um, within uh, academia and how academia functions. Um, it has enormous repercussions on the, um, the infrastructure that universities uh, need to develop and, and put into place. It has uh, repercussions on, for example, how peer review um, is being done. I, I just mentioned to, to Jay Jordan uh, just now uh, one of the professors that, who mentioned to me, well, his first article uh, in Nature had about uh, 10 different data points, and uh, he, uh, uh, his last article in Nature had 5 million uh, data points. So how do you manage that? Uh, how, uh, how do you do peer review on these types of things? Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a world that is really um, uh, creating a lot of, uh, of, uh, of challenges for us. Um, and these are, these are also reflected in uh, scholarly uh, publishing, uh, where we do notice that, uh, again, at one end, the data is, uh, is being, uh, becoming available uh, through, uh, besides the, uh, the, uh, the article, uh, the book, um, but also where we're really searching for 
uh, business models that work, uh, where we at least I, I noticed that there is a little bit of a difference between the United States and Europe in the uptake of, of, uh, of open access, and where we're really tr trying to, f uh, to feel our way around in, tr uh, in, the, uh, in moving from, uh, let's say, the big deals that we have at still at this point to a transference towards open access, and how are we able to finance that, how are we able uh, to do this. Um, we also see a lot of changes at, at the university, uh, where uh, the university um, is focusing on added value and also on making choices, and making sometimes quite hard choices, closing down uh, research lines, closing down research groups, and uh, really focusing on, on strengths in a worldwide competition uh, between uh, different research universities. Um, and of course, that has its effect on libraries too. We also have to uh, show our added value, just like the university is doing that. And I, I'm not I think it, it's, this also happens in the United States, but it definitely has happened in the Netherlands, that there are pressures um, have come up in the last few years from uh, politics, media, society, on uh, questioning uh, the, the relevance, the trustworthiness of science. Uh, we've had some major uh, scandals in the Netherlands of uh, fraudulent scientists. Uh, you know, and really prominent uh, scientists um, who basically made up uh, their, uh, their research data. Uh, yeah, um, but also um, where the National Science Foundation has said, well, the, the research has to, be, has to have a social relevance and also an applied relevance, and where questions also within politics are, are placed around um, uh, fundamental science. And, uh, and so there is this, this major discussion going on also. That's on the, on the one hand with, with research, on the other hand with education, and I think that is something you probably also noticed in the United States, is that there are really major questions being asked about, as well, the cost of uh, education and also the effectiveness of education. Uh, does it indeed generate that sort of effect that we think it does? Um, and um, so that uh, um, has put, I think, also academia somewhat in the defensive, and I do notice that in the Netherlands. Um, what we also notice is that uh, technological advancement is in, in a great extent taking place in the consumer market. Um, and uh, uh, where before you had the uh, uh, defense industry, but also the, uh, the research community that was really the driving force behind new developments in technology, now it's more and more uh, consumer market. And you notice that faculty are using uh, tools uh, that are not the tools of the university, but are basically using tools that are out, out there, that are quite often free, um, and then which pose a number of issues around um, yeah, what, what about that data that is stored all, all over the place at, at commercial uh, companies? Um, uh, do we need to do something about those things? So um, a lot uh, going on there too. Um, and again, that technical pro uh, technological progress, and this is a chart from Ray Kurzweil, and uh, as you know, you can really date it because his last, his last major data point, you could say, is the web. Uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of ha has happened since then, but the point of this chart is that you have basically um, exponential growth uh, of uh, new developments. It, it, it shows um, the uptake uh, of new technology by one quarter of the U.S. population. And what you can see is that um, for the telephone to have that type of uptake uh, in the uh, 1870s, uh, um, it took um, about 50, 60 years to have one quarter of the American population uh, have a telephone. Um, of course, if you uh, uh, go further uh, along in, 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 in history to more recent days, um, and you look at things like the iPhone, iPad, tablets, these types of things, well, that just has changed in a few years um, that that change has happened. So we, we see this exponential change uh, happening in technology and uh, how we're coping with that. That is something very new that um, our previous generations didn't have to deal with. Um, uh, I imagine uh, what you're also facing, like uh, what a lot of European universities are, are facing, are, are major budget cuts, um, which, are, which are not helping uh, to deal with this. And of course, also the cost of, in, of information is still, is still uh, um, quite often higher, outpacing inflation. Uh, yeah, um, 
So these are a number of urgencies that you could, um, you could describe, and there are many more, but I think these are some of the important ones. Now, how, how do libraries or how have libraries dealt uh, with change? And I think we can quite confidently say that libraries have, uh, when you look at the, uh, the past centuries, but also the number of uh, decades ago, uh, libraries have changed uh, quite tremendously. They have innovated, they have uh, added uh, a lot of digital services. Um, uh, one of my claims is always that we are generating more uh, time uh, for researchers and, and faculty to spend on research and teaching uh, instead of uh, uh, wasting their time in, in libraries finding, finding information. Uh, um, so a, a lot has a lot has done, been done there, but what we haven't done uh, to a great extent, and I think that is something is, will happen more and more, is we have not ended uh, services. Uh, yeah, we keep services in place, uh, we add new services, and we are spreading ourselves quite thin. And so, and we also keep within the existing library paradigm. Uh, we uh, yeah, we st keep thinking about uh, a particular context and develop new services out of that, and uh, that context has really changed, and I think we need to move beyond that. Um, one thing that is also not really hap uh, helping us is that the major driver for decisions about libraries uh, within a university context is, is budgetary uh, considerations. And obviously, uh, uh, budgets are important, and uh, there's a limit to the amount of money you want to put in a library, but that cannot be the only focus. And it's very hard, and, um, and I know there are a few, uh, a number of librarians out here, it's very hard to have that, um, that discussion uh, uh, within the university without having immediately uh, then uh, uh, discussions about the amount of money that goes into the library already and, uh, and, and have that uh, be the focus or have not be the, be the focus. And uh, as I already mentioned uh, through that chart from Ray Kurzweil, I think change is, is outpacing us. It's very hard to keep up, even not, not only as an individual uh, person, as an individual organization, but even as groups of organizations. It's very hard uh, to, keep, uh, to, keep that, uh, to keep that up. So let's have a, uh, a quick look at some of the uh, traditional functions we've had, and um, and these are, no, are functions that uh, yeah, um, that I've, um, I've uh, I think are are the traditional ones. There are, there are definitely other ones, but I'd, I'd like to focus on, on this group of, of functions, library functions. Um, and what I'll do, this is not a, a scientific uh, 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 scientific uh, impression. It's, it's rather my impression of how things are, are moving. And there could be a, a lot of discussion about that. But um, this uh, will, I hope, at least give a, a sense of kind of the, uh, the, the traditional functions that are kind of um, disappearing, um, going th falling through our fingers, taken up by elsewhere. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But this is, it is really the changing reality. Uh, so some, some things about selection acquisition books. Um, uh, in Europe, at least, we have been very slow in moving to approval plans. So this is, uh, this is uh, yeah, uh, uh, like the invention of, of uh, slicing bread or something in the United States. So it's, uh, uh, it's, this is, uh, but approval plans are relatively new at major research uh, uh, libraries in, in continental Europe. Um, and uh, so They've moved to that to a great extent. Uh, yeah, um, um, but the question is, how, well, how, how will this evolve with, with e-books? Are we, are we going to big deals uh, uh, of e-books also? Probably not because we won't be able to afford it. Um, we are all experimenting with patron-driven acquisition, uh, yeah, which has a number of issues involved also. Um, uh, so not that uh, straightforward. Um, um, uh, some of us would love uh, a Spotify for books uh, yeah, that you subscribe to it and, and, uh, and basically you can use, uh, read the books uh, uh, whichever you want. So what you do see in these trends, in, in, in these kinds of developments, is that selection is even to a greater extent uh, moving outside of the library. Uh, yeah. uh, one trend that, that, or it's not really a trend, but it's a, a, a phenomenon that's, that is starting up, uh, is that 
um, uh, through open access financing, a way to, to find open access financing for books. Um, uh, there is now an organization that's looking to partner uh, publishers with libraries, where libraries then will, early on, uh, before the publication of the book, will say, okay, I commit to this book, uh, I will buy it, and, and that will then allow for that publisher to make that book available in open access. Um, we'll see how that, if that works, but then you, you will do some sort of title by title selection, but then for, in fact, financing. Uh, the publication of that book. Uh, so that runs a bit counter to that trend. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the institutional uh, repository, uh, yeah, um, and I think I missed a slide. Let me just see. No, okay. Uh, the institutional repository, uh, the, um, we now have a variety of formal and gray literature in our repositories. I personally think that uh, repositories will not uh, really take off uh, in that extent to for formal literature, literature has already been published by a, a, a publisher, uh, and that will focus much more on dissertations, theses, great literature, uh, teaching-related materials, um, and of course also open access mandated publications. And again, there selection is not really an issue. It's, it takes it's rather taking place as as peer review and things that are being published and things that are being put in on the server by, by faculty and researchers. Um, and I think there is a slide indeed missing, uh, which is the, the slide, of course, about selection of journal, uh, journals, uh, where we really have the big deals. Uh, yeah, um, question is, are we able to continue to afford big deals? Uh, we might be moving more and more towards uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, more specified packages uh, yeah, that uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, are, are not as large and that are more, a little bit more specific uh, to, to the needs of, of, of our users. But also, of course, um, are we able to transition uh, to an open access model? Um, uh, and are we able to, to base that on the financing that we run, do now for, uh, for open access? If you look at what has happened in the UK, uh, you, where in fact um, uh, the mandate uh, for open access has been, uh, is there right now, and uh, where um, uh, the Finch report has had a big impact, uh, um, the, uh, the cost of publishing, of acquiring, of, of supporting that will go up quite, quite tremendously. So uh, the, the question is, is this, is then, it, will that be viable? We'll, we'll see. Um, let's look, move on to cataloging. Uh, yeah, right now, still uh, a lot of record sharing, obviously, du and duplication. We're duplicating these records in our own systems and item by item uh, cataloging also. I think uh, on the agenda of a lot of uh, uh, librarians is really the, the, uh, the efficiency of the back office to be able to cut in our back offices. That's really at the top of our, our agenda. And, um, and of course, the fact that we're moving into uh, a more and more cloud systems and very, um, where we are not are going to have um, our own catalog as uh, we have it now, um, but will be part of a larger, uh, larger entity, um, uh, will move more and more to uh, no du duplication, but basically adding the fact that we own something to one record uh, in somewhere in the cloud. So we're moving towards managing data flows, um, third-party created records. Uh, yeah, will uh, those of us who have uh, special collections uh, will focus on those types of things, of course. And um, these data flows, this this uh, will more and more be managed on a national and even international level uh, through knowledge bases, uh, things like that, with uh, some possibly some local enrichment. So the trend there is delocalization. Uh, uh, it's not something that really is, is taking place in, in the library any longer, and also non-duplication. So a lot of effort of pumping records from one system to another and converting these things and, and all of that stuff will, will end finally. Uh, yeah, so, um, so that will uh, also be uh, uh, more efficient. Uh, when we look at archiving, of course, things we've, we've done for centuries, uh, yeah, it's uh, now being done uh, for paper collections, still locally, locally managed, uh, curated. Uh, we uh, see a shift happening um, from open to closed stacks. So in Europe, we, uh, research libraries already mostly only had closed stacks, uh, but those things we, we still had in the open, we're moving to closed stacks. And uh, we'll, we'll see that uh, delivery of paper 
is going to be done uh, uh, by digitizing it. That will be the mode of delivery. And we notice also in the UK, uh, where it's being done fairly formally, uh, the national uh, policies of warehousing paper collections uh, on the national uh, level, having national retention uh, arrangements, um, or like it is being done in the Netherlands, where we keep uh, the material in place in our own uh, closed stacks, but make arrangements on um, how many copies we should need in, in, in a country, and uh, in that way manage that as a national collection. Uh, so again, in, in some way, uh, depending on uh, where you are, whether it's a QK model, a Dutch model, or a different one, uh, a certain delocalization of these paper collections, which are disappearing more and more into the background. Um, electronic collections, um, we still have, and I wish we were further there, we still have fairly vague uh, agreements between libraries and uh, publishers about permanent access. Uh, yeah. Um, and um, more and more libraries and also other types of organizations are, of course, uh, taking responsibility in order to uh, keep those uh, electronic collections in uh, e-depots or in things like Portico. Um, I, I think um, that uh, these transnational digital archives will be, um, be, will be, of course, more and more important, and that also uh, countries will uh, start mandating national digital uh, archiving strategies because uh, the, the, uh, the, of the importance of, of, this, um, of having that material kept uh, available. Uh, so there we have a trend towards international national arrangements but also infrastructure that is uh, more national or, or even uh, international. Uh, digital collections and data, uh, yeah, that is um, uh, very much ad hoc at, at this point. Uh, yeah, uh, as libraries, we're not doing, at least from my perspective, we're not doing a, uh, a very uh, great uh, service there. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, we're, I think a lot of us uh, in, in a number of countries are looking for arrangements, at least on a national level, to bring these digital collections together. Uh, one already for uh, purely an access uh, uh, for, for our researchers. Now, researchers really have to scrounge around and find where a particular, particular material, digital material, is being held, uh, yeah, and, uh, but also for... Um, uh, curation, long-term safekeeping of these digital files. We, uh, we need to have that infrastructure in place, nationally or international, uh, in order to do that. The reference desk. Uh, um, I, I, I used to be a, a reference li librarian. Uh, um, um, uh, I think th there are still libraries that have a reference desk. Uh, in Leiden, we, uh, we've stopped with that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, um, it's... Um, um, we consider it a waste, a waste of money. Uh, yeah. uh, so um, what you do see is it's, it's being replaced by virtual uh, desks, sometimes, uh, uh, some, sometimes just a physical who, what, where desk. You also see uh, different organizations within a university pulling together uh, and having one kind of service point for students, for example, where uh, library information could be uh, a, uh, a, a, a part of that, so you would have a multi-organizational uh, service. So the, the trend there is really that this is being minimized, and um, uh, there, there is no one in the since we we, we stopped uh, we stopped with the reference desk about uh, seven years ago. Uh, I've never received an email or a letter with where is the reference desk where uh, no one no one has ever noticed that uh, that it's gone. Um, so outreach. Uh, yeah, um, uh, we, um, I think we've moved uh, from collection specialists, and that was a very strong trend, at least in Europe, in European research libraries, where we, uh, uh, to, a lo to a long extent, had really people taking care of the collections. That was their only, only job. Uh, we've moved that to faculty liaison development of, of the typical library uh, services, but that is, is also changing, and, we are, and I'll talk about that in more detail a bit later, is that we're really uh, moving these people and also hiring new types of people uh, into services specialists, and then we're think thinking about research data, text mining, data mining, uh, copyright specialists, people who are into uh, e-publishing, geographical information, data sets, these types of things. And that's really the direction uh, we're moving into. So the, the trend there is it's service and expertise space, really expertise that uh, research groups, uh, faculty uh, uh, need. Um, and um, as you 
from the previous slides uh, where we talk about the collection where the selection is really not done anymore in, in a substantial way by library, then, yeah, then this is also a very, fairly logical uh, uh, move. Uh, making available, uh, yeah, um, uh, we, I, I, I talked a few moments ago about patron-driven acquisition. Uh, yeah, um, so we're moving, I think, from in-case, uh, building in-case collections to building in-time uh, collections. Uh, yeah, um, and, um, and also, I think, um, uh, we are also rethinking uh, our way of what do we mean by digitizing collections. Uh, up till fairly recently, one could say digitizing collections meant making a nice image of the collection and so that people could browse and look at that book and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. It does fulfill a need, but that is not, will not, is not sufficient. Uh, uh, people expect that these files can be used for computational research. Uh, yeah, and that could mean, obviously, that could mean images, but it also means that uh, OCR uh, is important, uh, that a lot of extra tools involved with these things are important. So a trend is digital, just-in-time, computational. The finded business, we, we are, of course, as libraries, we were very heavily in the finded business. We still are. Uh, the use of the catalog, uh, although the death of the catalog has been uh, announced a number of times already, um, uh, our use of the catalog is sky high uh, of our local uh, catalog, uh, or our catalog that's in the cloud at this point, but uh, is sky high. But nevertheless, um, I, th I don't think that is uh, a proposition that will have a long, a long future uh, of being in the find it business. We'll be, I think, uh, more and more into the get it business, uh, getting the information that a faculty need, making the arrangements, um, uh, whether it's through uh, negotiations and uh, um, immediately transactions behind the scene when uh, you do indeed have PDA, uh, yeah, or in, in other ways. Uh, yeah. So a shift to, to get it and that the, the find it uh, business and all of the, uh, the things that are involved with that of, of search systems will uh, take place, will be in the cloud, but we won't really have uh, local systems uh, in order to do that. Special collections. Uh, my, my library uh, has one of the foremost special collections in the Netherlands and Europe, uh, yeah, and it's um, often... A, of course, a traditional prestige object, uh, yeah. and uh, the role um, of these special collections in research and teaching has not always been substantial. Um, and um, what we've also noticed uh, with the budget cuts that, for example, happened in the UK, where, um, where, the, where questions were being asked about, well, why do you have these special collections at certain particular uh, libraries? Uh, the question was not asked at, uh, for the Bodleian and, and so on and so forth, but they are rather than the recipient of these special collections that go away from other institutions. Uh, but these are questions that will be, uh, will be asked uh, uh, to us. And, uh, yeah, um, uh, and the way I, at least I see it, is that the special collections can only, will only function and will only be financed at a university where they're really uh, used for research and, and teaching. And if, if you don't do that, then there is, there is very little uh, yeah, um, use for them. Uh, if you can do that, then, of course, a number of other uses will, will, uh, will be possible namely uh, societal outreach. Uh, I mentioned, for example, that the National Science Foundation is very much, um, in, uh, finds social societal relevance very important, so that goes for these collections too. You can build uh, relationships with the community, with, with uh, people who don't necessarily have a connection with the university. You can build those connections, and of course, and that also means that you can use it for fundraising. But special collections that Will not uh, will only have a museum function. Let's say will probably be moved to museums and won't be there for uh, at a at a university library. Uh, technology management. Uh, you, um, I think I think you could fill that in already by uh, having heard me talk about previous slides. But uh, the the local management of large number of, of library systems. That's what we are. We still have to uh, to a great degree. Uh, we won't be investing in more uh, systems. Uh, we will. Uh, yeah, that will be a very hard sell. Uh, so we will uh, uh, downscale the the number of systems and we'll bring them into the cloud. 
uh, these are not uh, any more um, syst- uh, types of systems that are where you uh, want to say, well, that is going to be a distinctive factor for our uh, university or our library. So all of these things will indeed move to the cloud. That's, of course, for OCLC, uh, on OCLC audience, uh, no new message. And um, the technology effort will be focused much more on the connection between these types of systems and particular tools, particular uh, uh, innovative systems that you still have at a local, at a local level. Um, it also means that some national uh, information infrastructure will become uh, irre- irrelevant. Uh, yeah, uh, when uh, yeah, um, uh, Lorcan announced me, uh, he mentioned our, our National Information Infrastructure Steering Committee, and we are in fact in the process of getting rid of our National Information Infrastructure. Now, let me define that. That's basically the library infrastructure, uh, the, the, the union catalog uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the place where we share records, where we catalog, where uh, these types of things, and we are uh, we are basically we want to uh, get rid of that in between in a year or three, let's say, uh, and really move into the cloud uh, and, and, and function there. So again, a, dre- a trend towards delocalization um, and then a very much more specific use of technology uh, locally where you really look at the, um, uh, the, uh, the needs of the researcher and students and teaching faculty and where you, you need to make uh, connections uh, between a variety of different uh, techno- uh, technological platforms in order to be able to do certain things. So how do we act in this, in this context of, of exponential change? So um, some of the things we're trying to do, as, as you could see from those, the previous slides, is that we're trying to stop doing a lot of the generic work that can easily be, be done elsewhere, that can easily be, be outsourced, and really focus on the specific needs uh, for furthering uh, the education research at our own institution. And uh, what is really important, and I'll talk about that later on in my last slides, is to collaborate on a national and transnational level with uh, uh, organizations like Portico, Harty Trust, uh, OCLC, and, and, and many, many others. Um, function of libraries in, in this context, I think if you look at it at a, at a, at a sufficiently high level, the, the function in a way remains the same. Uh, yeah, uh, so we're still there to fulfill the information needs, um, the, the library, and as, as you probably know as a librarian, the library has never been as well used as a physical space as it is right now. Uh, students just flock uh, to, to libraries, especially if, they, are, if they, they look nice and if they, they have a lot of uh, uh, um, just comfortable and, 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 and uh, an interesting space. Um, what we also notice is that libraries have taken over a lot of uh, work from other areas, uh, other divisions, other organizations within the university. So uh, things like CRIS, the current research information system in the Netherlands has basically, with all libraries, have moved to the library uh, from other uh, organizations. Uh, so things like uh, taking care of research data, uh, e-learning objects, all of that, uh, uh, tends, tends to move to the library. So the library within the university context is still very much a trusted partner, and, uh, and one, one uh, moves uh, uh, new things into, into, that, uh, into that organization. So it becomes much more an information manager uh, for the university. Um, where we are trying to go uh, in Leiden uh, with the library is that we're really becoming the expert center on digital information for research and, and, and teaching, now, and I'll talk about that later on. Um, if, if that is important, we really need to be in that workflow um, of, of the researcher and the teacher, and that is and the teaching faculty. And that is something that's really new, I think, uh, for most of us. Uh, we've not been in, really in that workflow. We've set up systems that they could use, but they were not thought out of being part of a particular workflow in research. Uh, an organization that has done that, for example, and I thought about it, is, is uh, people like Elsevier. They, they've really gone and sat next to researchers and looked at what they were doing and then design systems that might, uh, might fit in that. And that's not something uh, we are used to, but I think it's really necessary to, in order to, to do that. Um, uh, so um, uh, all of these uh, functions also mean that small libraries are not going to cut it. Uh, they're not going to be able to survive, um, and they will need to to uh, 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 be taken on in a larger organization that can really uh, have the expertise in hand in order to be able to to do uh, these types of things. 
Um, so um, we are now in our third year of our strategic plan, which is called Partner in Knowledge. And uh, I'll talk, uh, basically that plan it takes on these, what, these kind of slides that I've just shown you about how is our future going to evolve. Is, it takes that along and then kind of tries to chart out uh, uh, directions where we're, we're trying to take uh, uh, Leiden University libraries. And so um, we want to be a partner in knowledge, uh, yeah, so not only a, a service organization for uh, research and teaching, uh, we will always be a service organization, obviously, but we also try to uh, be more involved um, at, at an early stage uh, with, with uh, research and with uh, curriculum changes and things like that. And so my, the rest of my talk will be about these types of issues, um, virtual research environments, data management, text data mining, these types of things. Um, and I've also indicated on these slides where we are uh, with uh, all of these uh, projects. Sometimes they're still pilots, sometimes they're being explored, sometimes we are in, in, in really in production. And it also goes for uh, uh, teaching support uh, that, that, we are, uh, that we are offering. So let's, um, uh, what was important uh, in order to be able to do this is that we moved from 10 library organizations on campus to one library organization. So we did that in 2010. If, if we hadn't done that, this simply would not have been, been possible. And the strategic plan was developed really uh, bottom up. This was our second, the second strategic plan that I uh, uh, led. And the first plan we did top down, uh, which was a good choice at that point for the library. But the second one was really bottom up. And that really made a, a huge, a huge uh, difference. We also changed a lot of function profiles. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, again, that is something you can imagine from the previous slides. The subject specialists, uh, yeah, uh, they had a, a function profile called information collection specialist. Uh, we, we maintained that uh, for the time being, but we also added ICT consultant uh, to, uh, to that profile. It doesn't mean that the day that you get a profile ICT consultant that you are an ICT uh, consultant, uh, yeah, but it does indicate where we, uh, where we want to go, and we also did a lot of uh, training, a lot of, uh, you put quite a bit of money into staff training and further development, and also with each hire we do, uh, we, we really look at the profile and the expertise someone brings into the organization. What we also did is that we really ex explicitly, which was also a new, explicitly in the appointment of, of the staff, uh, created time for, for new expertise. Uh, yeah, um, uh, and that they had time to, to develop that. And we focused on working in projects. That whole collaboration thing really means not just collaborating within, um, within the library, but also collaborating with faculty, with other organizations. And those are skills that people don't necessarily automatically have. Uh, yeah. So the approach there is that we mo are moving uh, more and more f uh, towards an uh, expertise uh, approach, uh, someone who... Uh, uh, knows everything about data mining or someone who uh, knows a lot about data curation uh, instead of the traditional subject approach, oh, I have a PhD in French Lit, so um, that's uh, what I'm going to do at the library, then I'll, 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 I'll be the French Lit faculty liaison, for example. So we're moving away from, from that. Um, I'll come back to, to the following point, which is the, the balance between uh, the expertise that we can develop within the library and the mediation with other organizations that have uh, that expertise and where we can bring faculty in contact with. Um, uh, because that is, is, is really an important, um, we are grappling with that, we are uh, searching on how to do this, and it's not easy to find that balance. So what, are, what is the expertise and how deep uh, does it ha expertise have to be, and when can and you really uh, make sure that you can basically connect the faculty uh, member to uh, some other organization. And then uh, collaboration is really central. Uh, yeah, we, we do this uh, with collaborating with the faculty, with research groups, with a computing center, you name it, all the different organizations within the university, but also with outside organizations so in the Netherlands, such as SURF, National Data Archives, Microsoft Research for our VREs. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, collaboration is really, is really central. And as I mentioned, we, we started this bottom up, but we are, of course, now having also the strategic uh, discussion with the leadership. So let's look at the research life cycle and try to position these different uh, services 
uh, within that life cycle. Again, this is one life cycle. Uh, th there are many ways uh, to look at this, but I've, I've basically used this. So there's obviously uh, the research component. Um, what we've uh, put into place are virtual research uh, environments where um, uh, research groups can work together, uh, yeah, uh, can share uh, information, can write uh, uh, yeah, papers together, can uh, create blogs, uh, yeah, wikis, uh, websites from, uh, from in, within that uh, virtual research environment and, and publish that. Uh, so um, th there's a lot of, uh, of functions in that virtual research environment, and at this point we are supporting, I believe, about 15, 15 uh, research groups uh, yeah, with uh, that VRE, and they and they're from all of this, over the. Uh, uh, the, uh, the different disciplines, except for uh, the exact sciences. Uh, we've not yet been able to make an inroad into the exact sciences, but law, uh, uh, humanities, social sciences, you name it, they're all uh, using this. Um, uh, because of our belief of, that we need to do something with data, and we did a project where we uh, really, on a national level, looked at how research groups are dealing with data, which quite often is quite scary uh, when you see the results of that. Um, so we've implemented a, a data information office. Uh, we have two data librarians uh, uh, at this point in the organization and where we help um, our researchers write data management plans where we look together with them at possible data formats, data models, uh, things like that. Uh, yeah, um, uh, these are also, and you know that of course you're in the United States and happening in Europe also, that these are requirements from funding agencies that data management plans are, are being uh, put forward. Within our VREs we've also created data labs um, where uh, the data gathering uh, can take place, where data storage can happen, data use. It's basically the whole life cycle of data from uh, thinking about data to creating it and using it. Um, as, uh, as a role for, for as a, from, a, uh, from our library, we've not chosen the role to curate the data long term, no, but I'll, I'll talk about it in a few moments. And we are uh, adding new areas of expertise. There is a librarian uh, really specializing herself into text and, and data mining, uh, linked data, geographical information. We've all uh, uh, got pilots projects running around that where we're trying to um, figure out uh, uh, first of all, what is needed there, what our role could be, uh, yeah, um, uh, and getting also the expertise on board, you know, and able to do that. It could very well be that in the, in when we progress further, we decide, well, this is an area where uh, we might we thought we we could play a role, but we're not going to play that role. Uh, so that really still needs to uh, to 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 happen. To uh, to we need to experience that. This is from a, a poster that was given at uh, the data curation uh, conference uh, from uh, our data librarians, and w which really pl shows the role uh, uh, that we, or, or the position we're trying to take. And uh, we really try to work as the front office of our uh, national data archives. Uh, yeah. And uh, so they had the problem that they had a very difficult time getting connected to research groups, um, while we are able to do that quite, quite relatively easily. And, um, and they have a lot of expertise that we don't have in, uh, in our own organization. So we're really uh, working uh, together with them and um, uh, so that now when you have created a lot of data in one of these uh, uh, data lab components of the VRE and you want to uh, 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 store it permanently in the data archive, it's really just a push of the button uh, and a whole bunch of programs start running and package it and check it and, and, and send it off to the data archive and where it's, it's being stored. So that is the, the, the idea behind that. Publication, another step in this, in this life cycle. Again, VREs could play a role, uh, of course, in, in not uh, very formal pu publishing, but they could play a role in pushing material to the repository, managing these website, blogs, wikis. Um, uh, we have, of course, institutional repo uh, uh, repository. We've also set up uh, Leiden University Press in, in order to, to do this where everything that we do has, uh, is available digitally. Um, but we also have set up a copyright office to support uh, our, our students as well as our researchers uh, in getting uh, copyright advice and how uh, to negotiate with publishers about that. Uh, yeah. 
and um, we are now in uh, the start of um, a setting up publication advice services. At Leiden, we are fortunate to have CW, CWTS, which is a, uh, a well-known bibliographic, uh, bibliometric uh, uh, center, and we're collaborating with them to see how we can uh, do certain things uh, together with them uh, uh, so that we can provide these types of, types of services. Registration archiving, uh, I mentioned to Chris that has come uh, towards the library, so that uh, also helps us in uh, registration of publication of research projects. Um, in the Netherlands, we've set up, uh, as, a, uh, as a, all of the libraries together with OCLC, have set up a digital uh, author identifier, so we are assigning that to our, uh, our university authors. And uh, yeah, these um, uh, virtual research environments and data labs, as I mentioned, they really focus on the time when the project is running. Uh, so that is the, the archiving that is done at that point, uh, but nothing, nothing more. Um, as in the review process, we have decided that we have, we have no role to play in review of, of, of scientific information. Um, there are other libraries who might think otherwise about that and who want to support systems that do open peer review support, those types of things. Curation, uh, yeah, the repository material uh, is curated at the EDPO in the National Library in the Netherlands. So there is a, a connection where they, they harvest that uh, material. And we have our uh, uh, research data curated to National Data Archives in the way I just, I just described. And this year is also be, going to be very interesting for us because we're going to close down uh, our first VRE that research groups uh, has finished uh, uh, the, the research they've done. They have a lot of data. And so now we're trying to figure out how we're going to select what needs to be, uh, uh, what needs to be uh, curated long term. And uh, so that, that will be very interesting to, to see how that uh, happens. Uh, dissemination, of course, an important part. Uh, um, the repository is, as, as all repositories, connected with lots of search engines. Um, we manage the publication pages of our faculty. Uh, the VRE, again, can do some sort of uh, dissemination. LUP, we were a founding member of OAPEN, the Open Access Publishing in European Networks, where we focus on monographs in, the science, in, the, in social science and humanities. And we are a partner also in Knowledge Unlatched, where we're trying to bring uh, publishers and, and, and libraries together for open access publishing of, of monographs. So we're really trying there with, through a variety of experiments, but also through some services, to see how we can play a role in dissemination. Impact, uh, of course, very important for, for scholars. Uh, yeah, w through our publication advice service, together with CWTS, we, uh, we, uh, we would like to help them to choose uh, strategies that uh, can help them get the greatest impact of their publication. And uh, yeah, so um, that is still very much, uh, very much uh, at the very beginnings of our, of, of our attempt. So we'll see how that goes. Funding, uh, again, we haven't started this up yet, but what uh, is in the works is that we want to collaborate with universities' research and innovation services that are really doing the IPR, uh, the patenting uh, for, for authors, and to see uh, uh, what their needs are, mainly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, PhD students, to get them set up about uh, what, uh, what IPR is, how to use patent information, so that uh, they uh, get more uh, sophisticated about uh, dealing with these types of things. We can do the same thing for curriculum uh, life cycle. I've, I've, I've kept that shorter. Uh, yeah. uh, the nice thing is that when you start with some of these things is that um, uh, sometimes it has effects that you are completely didn't know when you started that project. Uh, when we started a number of years ago with the, the virtual research environments, we clearly had in mind this is going to be for research groups. And what our project leader noticed is that uh, obviously these researchers are also teaching faculty and that they were involving students uh, in VREs. And um, since we are a research institution and since we want to connect research with the education of our students, uh, the, uh, the, the vice rector for uh, uh, teaching really found it important that we would set up VREs uh, which are really uh, uh, have, a, have, a, have as a goal that we involve um, uh, students uh, in, in research. Um, and so that's uh, what we're doing this year. So I can't 
report on that, but we'll have uh, about six VREs with a very different focus, uh, sometimes large groups of students, sometimes small groups of students, different type of um, um, types of uh, research and research um, mode uh, in which they are, and, uh, and we'll see what, what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, we do open courseware and MOOC support. We have uh, an, a number of faculty who do MOOCs at uh, Coursera. And where we do there uh, mostly is uh, we do the copyrights uh, for learning objects and um, we try to find solutions for the reading lists uh, uh, to, to have these students have readings that there are ex uh, material that is accessible to them. Digital information literacy in the curriculum is very important uh, to us. Uh, uh, it's, it has been quite successful, and we've really created modules that are focused on the learning objectives of that moment for that student in that particular in that particular field, and then uh, and then uh, either do it ourselves or in close relationship with the faculty. It's in a lot of the programs, it's now part of the curriculum, and of course, a BA and MA thesis repository. So the results uh, of this have been that the, the library has uh, become more known within the university for these new types of services, and also the image uh, that the library had is, is changing. Um, library staff, to a great extent, are uh, enthusiastic about it. A lot of the, uh, the staff um, have chosen new roles and new areas that they want to uh, grow in, develop further in. And uh, what is very nice is that we now notice that uh, researchers who are putting together a research proposal for funding are coming to us at an early stage of that funding proposal. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens often enough, uh, and it happened never before. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and that is, uh, is a, a very nice uh, change that has happened. And also the university has allocated extra funding for some of these types of uh, uh, services. We also know that, as I already mentioned with the VRE, but also with the copyright, um, you can uh, sometimes set something up for a particular purpose and, and when need, an, a particular need arises that you haven't foreseen, it works there also and you can very, uh, uh, very re react quite quickly. So. Um, and so we can also, with these types of services, show the impact that the library is having on uh, primary uh, services, on, primary, on the primary uh, goals. <laughs> this is true. Um, and um, um, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, I think the library, uh, to, a, to a greater extent, is, is, is changing, and uh, we sometimes have to feel that we sometimes have to pull people along uh, uh, with that change. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not easy. But what is holding us back? Now, transition is, um, is always difficult. It, it, it's, it's difficult to manage, and it, it takes years because you've, you've staff, you have particular expertise, or you have uh, not particular expertise in place. So it takes years in order to make a change like that, and that uh, is not easy. Also, some of our users are holding us back. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Uh, we, uh, we've, we're in the midst of uh, refurbishing our university library, and we started with that uh, with a survey. Uh, and the university library is mainly used by the humanities uh, students and faculty. And we asked them what, what, you, what you want if we re refurbish the place, what you want. And so they said, well, we want you to monitor the quiet study areas. We want more material in open stacks. We have limited need for group uh, spaces and don't close the institute libraries. So what did we do? Well, we created a variety of study areas, uh, quiet, noise, collaborative lounge, reduced the stack, open stacks, and created learning in environments there. We are creating a variety of group uh, spaces, and we closed down all of the institute libraries. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, uh, and uh, we did a survey uh, later on, and, and uh, when we were uh, uh, basically had the last plans and proposed that to the students, and they, in fact, said, well, looking at your plans, we realize now that we need more group spaces. Uh, yeah. So, again, this just as an, as an indication that you, we don't have to follow blindly what a particular group of, of students, of, of customers, of users say at that point, uh, so, and still keep on, uh, on, on with our own strategy. Some of our librarians are holding us back, uh, yeah, who find this change difficult uh, or not necessary or even negative. Uh, yeah. 
also a framework, a tradition. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, we, we still think in particular concepts. I, I've also been to library school and we've uh, been indoctrinated really well uh, in order to think about uh, certain things. Uh, that is not necessarily the world we live in any longer. And uh, so we need, sometimes really need to, to change that framework. Institutional territory, uh, a very important one in, 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 in two ways. Uh, within the institution itself, uh, yeah, we're, of course, treading on uh, the, the garden paths of, of the computing center and vice versa, um, but also um, universities and university libraries among themselves uh, as, as different institutions. Um, I will come to that in a few moments, but I really think that is, is really one of our, our, our main problems is that uh, we are still thinking too much uh, from an institutional perspective. And um, even all the changes that I've, uh, that I've discussed where, we try, where some of them we've already made, some of them we are planning to make or trying to make them, even if when we've done all of that, uh, we'll still have difficulties. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a few moments. And of course, it's risky. Uh, uh, it's, uh, this doesn't happen uh, just uh, uh, without any, any pushback from, from some faculty, from some administrators. Uh, yeah. So it's, it is risky. There are also lots and lots of uncertainties. I've enlisted a number of them here, uh, but uh, you can uh, fill num lots of slides with the uncertainties. And this is also the main point that goes with institutional uh, territory, is lack of scale. Even when you do all of this, uh, we uh, won't uh, be able to um, uh, fulfill all of those needs, all of those expertise areas. We won't be able to manage all of that as a single, as a single library. So um, we're trying to roll out services uh, university-wide. Uh, yeah. And when you look, for example, at just the research data, uh, the question is, are you able with two data librarians that we have right now, uh, are you able to fulfill that need? My, 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 uh, my thinking is no, uh, that we won't be able to fulfill that need. Are we able to get more uh, data librarians? I don't know, perhaps within a number of years, I have no idea. Um, but also, is, are they focusing on a particular level? And when you go then, for example, in psychology or in linguistics or in uh, the, the, the expertise that is necessary in order to uh, support these research group, uh, groups uh, is, is much more in-depth, sophisticated, and particular to that, uh, to that discipline. Um, and then you almost roll back into the, the old model of uh, yeah, uh, the PhD in French, who knows how to do this in French. Uh, yeah. So um, lack of scale and, 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 and trying to do this as a single institution is, 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 is step. So you have breadth and, and depth uh, issues. And we, we simply cannot specialize in this whole range that I've just mentioned. That's why I also was very explicit about there are some things we, we will stop doing because um, they, they, uh, they will not work. Um, and it goes beyond collaboration. Collaboration is important, uh, but, um, and it's a good stepping stone to get things, certain things done, uh, but to have um, common platforms in order to do all of this, uh, to be able to, to use expertise from other universities, from other libraries, uh, it really moves beyond pure collaboration. And um, we need to find a, um, an organizational structure and financing in order to be able to, to do this. So we need these new national, international infrastructures uh, in order to really be able to do this. And uh, for uh, when we look at the more traditional uh, uh, things, uh, that, uh, that slowly comes into place with the cloud service that OCLC and others are putting in place. But when we're thinking about uh, yeah, data services, uh, all of these types of things, that is still uh, very much uh, yeah, uh, in, in, its, in, in the initial phases. Um, so that thinking uh, about uh, organizations, can, can network nodes, member organizations, strategic alliances, uh, can, the, can these work? Uh, I think we're very much at the very initial uh, uh, thinking about that. And, um, and it's, it runs counter to the present organization we're all in. Uh, an organization where certain budgets are allocated, an organization that has certain goals, that has, uh, is in com competition with other organizations. Uh, yeah, and that is uh, an organizational form that was ideal for the world we, I just described at the beginning, but is not functioning uh, really 
in, uh, in the longer term or will not function in the longer term uh, for the, t the things we're trying to do. So moving forward, well, uh, we are trying to start this discussion. Um, it does need uh, personnel transition, new, new skills, uh, training, education, extremely important in you know, being able to, to do this to collaborate with other organizations and other libraries and to try to figure out other ways uh, to, uh, to organize ourselves. And uh, what really has worked for us, at least, is really start these pilot projects in very close collaboration with, with faculty. That is, is, really, is really essential. And to really demonstrate the value, the impact these new services have, and, and sometimes that can be a disappointment that uh, when you're in pilot phase and it's all free, faculty say, wonderful, great, we're using this. And then you say, well, we're now out of a project phase and we're going to charge you X amount of uh, euros uh, for the service, then the enthusiasm might become less. So, um, but also be proud and, uh, and show your results. And uh, I think uh, we all, um, that's something we really need to do. So let's put that, trans that uh, fundamental transformation of the library and of all the library organization where we are organized on the agenda and create a roadmap towards that. Um, thank you very much for your attention. So uh, thank you very much for that you know, very full, very rich uh, overview of uh, uh, academic library uh, issues, concerns. We have time for some uh, questions. Uh, if you uh, are going to speak, uh, maybe you could identify yourself as a uh, courtesy to the, to the audience and the, uh, and the speaker. We have a mic here, and we'll be taking uh, questions over the network as well. Uh, while we're getting ready, maybe we'll, we'll go uh, Bill and then uh, Andrew. Um, while, while the mic is moving, uh, I might ask you, you mentioned the VREs, Virtual Research Environments, and Microsoft Research. Are you, are you using Microsoft's? SharePoint. Support SharePoint, for yeah. we're using SharePoint. Yeah, we're using SharePoint plus the the uh, the RIC framework, uh, okay. the, the Research Information Center framework, uh, in order to provide to provide these uh, these services. Do many other people use that? Are you? Yes, uh, we um, uh, at least in the Netherlands, uh, a good number of universities are, are starting to use it. Utrecht, Delft, uh, Rotterdam. Uh, are, are, are using that, um, okay. and I also notice uh, in in uh, um, University College Dublin uh, yeah, uses yeah. Uh, and, so there are um, uh, so, uh, yeah. British Library. Yeah. Uh, okay, Bill. So uh, I'm Bill Carney with the Business Development Area, and I was uh, interested about your comments on the retention of the paper collections <clears throat> in the project that I'm working on right now. I wonder if you could comment a little more fully on the current status of that shared print initiative? Okay, well, at least uh, w with regard to the Netherlands, uh, we uh, had already an agreement in place for our journals, first of all, for the paper journals, uh, where uh, yeah, we decided that we, we were fairly early on in saying we were going to go electronic only in the Netherlands. We weren't able basically to afford to have both an electronic version of the journal and a paper version. So already like, I would say, uh, 12, 13 years ago, the university library said, well, if it's electronic and we have arranged uh, permanent, uh, permanent access and uh, the e-depot of the, the National Library collects the digital files, we will stop uh, with the, uh, the paper uh, journal. And um, we arranged a, a division of subject areas uh, where a, one library would, re would retain uh, the paper copy of that journal. Uh, yeah, um, so, for example, Leiden uh, deals with everything that deals with uh, language and, and literature, for example, all of those journals. Uh, yeah. So a few years ago, we also decided that we were going to look at the monographs, paper monographs. Uh, that is a very different uh, um, way of uh, having to do that. We didn't have the money in order to do a project like one one, one did in the UK. Uh, yeah, um, so what we said, well, we have these closed stacks everywhere. Uh, each library has them. Uh, so let's uh, also not uh, uh, take on a lot of cost, but let's decide that uh, within the, the, the country, uh, uh, and if there are more copies of a particular book, um, they, you, we will have to retain three copies. And so whoever is stuck with the last three uh, will uh, have to uh, keep them. And if, if you want to get rid of, uh, if you have indeed monographs you want to get rid of, uh, that is basically the, the golden rule. Uh, and you look in the National Union catalog in order to check that. Uh, so it's a very kind of pragmatic uh, yeah, and a low uh, administration 
uh, approach uh, that we've chosen. Does that fill, uh, f uh, give you enough info? Andrew. Hi, uh, Andrew Pace from Global Product Management. So uh, I was wondering about the level of optimism you have for an international infrastructure. As we've rolled out cloud services globally, we find people are in favor of it as long as we have one in France and one in Germany and one in the Netherlands and one in the UK, um, which becomes a bit of a regional infrastructure or national you right. know, infrastructure again. At least I can, I can say in the Netherlands we will get rid of the national infrastructure. We will, we will move to an international uh, environment. Uh, I know in France that's um, um, more difficult. Uh, you, I think uh, Germany might move that way. I think there, there are discussions going on in Germany about this. Uh, you, um, uh, I, I think uh, we will not be able to do it on otherwise, and uh, unless you have indeed uh, from, from the government, because if they, they see it as a strategic, uh, strategic infrastructure for that particular country that you get uh, financing from the government in order to really do this. Uh, yeah. But I think um, uh, just like uh, uh, scholars and research uh, is, is a collaborative uh, uh, internationally, that infrastructure will ultimately have to reflect that also. And some things are easier to internationalize than others. Yeah, true. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll take a question maybe from the network now, Melissa. Sure, we have a question from Karen McKeon, and her question is, what is the role of metadata and editorial work to tag data in discovery of data? And are there emerging standards or best practices you might share? So it's a, a question about metadata for research, research data? I think it was. I think it was. Yeah. A, I think it was a general yeah. comment. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I. To be honest, I don't have the uh, the the exact if, uh, standards uh, uh, right on the, the tip of my tongue. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, we do know that um, in order to do certain uh, research, um, the, the standards are very different from discipline to discipline. Um, and uh, depending on the type of research you do, you will probably also have to extend uh, certain metadata uh, issues. So there is definitely not one, one standard uh, in order to encode that sort of information. Uh, it's a, it's, there's a large variety of, of that. So on your um, question, on your comments about uh, scalar emphasis, mm -hmm. I've been looking for an opportunity to use that phrase. Um, the, um, uh, you mentioned that in the future, um, digital collections, the main, you, you know, your, your, your model of management of digital collections will be computational access over digital collections. So going back to Andrew's question, um, do you see that happening at a global Hattie Trust-like level, uh, a Dutch corpus level, uh, a Leiden yeah. level? Uh, um, um, yeah. You know, um, well, we are, we are now, I'm, I'm chairing an, an effort in the Netherlands to come to the national infrastructure exactly for, for, this, uh, for this type of material, digital, uh, digitized uh, materials from our collections. Um, and um, we are indeed setting up uh, an, a national infrastructure. My, uh, I've already announced that if that national infrastructure is sound and we can finance it, I will get rid of my own uh, the, the local infrastructure. Uh, yeah, one of my colleagues has said she will not do that. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, but basically, I think we, we won't be able to finance all of this. Uh, we won't be, be able to finance local infrastructure, national infrastructure, and make sure that there are aggregators that push it into uh, Europeana and, and all of these types of things. Uh, all of this has to be paid for. And, uh, yeah, and we'll need to, um, uh, to rethink how, uh, how we set up infrastructure and what that means at the local level and what we can do away at the local level. Uh, but I, I think, um, at least from my perspective, we'll, we will get rid of a lot of uh, local infrastructure. Okay. The uh, similar University of Utrecht, we understand, is um, discussing um, not having a local discovery layer and relying on network level services. Right. Um, you did say something about Discovery Cloud. Can you see a similar uh, trend here? Uh, yes. Well, um, uh, Utrecht um, uh, basically said uh, at this point, well, we're not going to buy Discovery Layer uh, because 
uh, will have uh, Google and, and other uh, search engines. I, I think it's a little bit too early yet for that. Uh, yeah, if we did that right now, we would not be able to make uh, a, a lot of the local information available uh, to, our, to our users. Um, I also have problems with um, basically counting on Google uh, to do certain things uh, with, uh, with whom we don't have any contracts and we don't know how long Google will do uh, particular types of uh, services. So uh, that is not the, the, the road I'm, I'm looking at. So the road I'm looking at is, um, is uh, search engines like WorldCat or like Primo, Primo Central, these types of things, which we're not hosting. We have Primo and Primo Central. We're not hosting it ourselves. It's in the cloud already. Uh, yeah. And uh, this is for us the way, the way to go. And it might very well be that, yeah, you don't need your own Primo uh, or uh, WMS or whatever it might be uh, yeah, interface anymore in, in a number of years. That might, that might, okay. that might be the case. So we'll take a question from Chip, and, and then we'll go um, back for a couple of network questions. Okay. Um, Kurt, Chip Milgis, uh, Vice President of Business Development. I was interested in your comments about Chris Systems and uh, also the comments about assigning researcher IDs. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you're managing that process of assigning researcher IDs and, and the process of deploying the CRIS. Right. So we have a, um, uh, the, um, what was formerly PICA and uh, uh, later on became uh, yeah, OCLC, we have an, an author uh, thesaurus uh, there. Um, in, uh, and where we had a project a good number of years ago where we uh, created then an author ID connected with that uh, author thesaurus. And um, so what we do at the university is when we get in a new uh, faculty member or a new researcher at whatever level, it could be a, a PhD student uh, also, uh, um, and that person is not yet in that, uh, in that thesaurus, um, uh, they, uh, they will be added uh, by our catalogers, and uh, so an, a, a, an author, a DAI, will be assigned, assigned to them. The DAI is not uh, connected to Leiden. It is a national uh, DAI, and there are, of course, lots of these types of initiatives uh, internationally where we, there are standards where we could connect uh, with, with that. Uh, but that is basically the DAI that if that author remains in the Netherlands, uh, uh, he or she will carry that with, with her or him, can, can kind of engrave it on their grave and so that you can always uh, find their, their bibliographical uh, uh, information from them. Uh, so it's, it's um, uh, when, when they're appointed, they, they, get, they get the DAI if they don't have one yet. The CRIS um, current research information system is uh, more widely <laughs> w more widely used in a European context than a, than in a U.S. context. Right. Could, could you say maybe just a, a, a few words for the U.S. audience about what the CRIS is and how okay. how the library is involved? Okay, a, a CRIS does an, a number of things. Basically, two major things: it keeps track of um, what the uh, the production the uh, of a um, of a uh, an author a researcher is, uh, and that is uh, articles, books, uh, weblogs, uh, you, um, you name it, all of that. And it also keeps track of all of the research uh, uh, official research projects at the university uh, and also the funding of that. It doesn't it doesn't uh, it's not a funding system. It's not that, but it it keeps track of all of the different projects and connects. Uh, the output, the bibliographical output, with these projects, so that you uh, can uh, create reports for funding agencies, but also for the Ministry of Education, of um, uh, how, how much a particular project has um, has resulted into into um, uh, published published information. Oh. And what and what we do is we manage the system uh, within the faculties. Uh, there are people who uh, then uh, make sure that particular data is added, like uh, if there's a new pro research project, it's added into the database. And, uh, and in that way, we connect that information also with our repository uh, so that uh, we can uh, generate the, um, uh, the publication pages on our website for our authors. Uh, through those systems, we can make these connections also. Um, 
Okay, we go. And, and what some uh, what some libraries are doing, for example, Eindhoven is doing that right now with Vivo. Uh, yeah, is using uh, using uh, uh, linked data and and semantics uh, in order to uh, kind of get a, um, a, a cloud of information uh, from a variety of systems, but including these systems of connections between scientists, between researchers, what kind of areas they've been publishing in, what their preferred second, third, or, or whatever uh, authors are, and uh, and in, in in a way create a knowledge base for expertise at. at at your university. Okay, we'll go to um, Melissa for uh, a couple of questions and uh, we might finish then. Great, thank you. The first question is from Marie Morgan and her question is, what is a virtual research environment? Okay. Well, I'm sorry I didn't explain that. Uh, virtual research environment is a digital uh, environment uh, where uh, yeah, uh, researchers who are working on a, a common research project uh, collaborate. Uh, yeah, and uh, that, that goes from the very banal, uh, from having a joint agenda uh, yeah, um, uh, to um, workflows. Uh, when, when I've done this, then this, this task comes to you. And uh, uh, so fairly banal stuff to um, uh, working together on um, uh, publications, um, um, having v variety of levels of uh, authorization uh, within that environment where you can keep stuff just for yourself, you can share it with particular people or with the whole group, um, where you also have versioning of, of materials where you can also uh, have the data lab store, uh, the data, research data, uh, you, um, uh, 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 as I mentioned, push uh, uh, information into web, wiki, blogs, these type, and publish, uh, publish that. All of that can be managed within a virtual research environment. Thank you. There's another question from Christopher Cronin. Um, Kurt, thanks for the excellent talk. Can you talk more about the impact on human resources management? How have your staff lines and the expertise within those ranks been changing in order to facilitate the changes you have described? For instance, are traditional reference librarian or cataloger or other lines being replaced with different staff with different skills? Or are existing staff transforming themselves to assume entirely new roles? Uh, both. Uh, yeah. um, uh, so um, uh, we uh, asked librarians to, to think about uh, when we did the, the whole strategic planning uh, about uh, different roles and what they thought uh, their, uh, their, 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 their future could be uh, within that, uh, that direction. Uh, you, um, and we, of course, also asked uh, their managers, their supervisors, to see whether that is indeed a, a, a plausibility or possibility. Uh, you, um, uh, so there are a number of uh, uh, collection uh, reference librarians who are uh, uh, who have been retrained into data librarian people who do uh, text mining things like that. Um, but also we uh, since a number of years we've said well each each appointment even if it's in the in the stacks uh, will not be an automatic an automatic uh, uh, fulfilling uh, yeah, of that of that vacancy. All of that will be uh, put. Uh, within the cabinet will be discussed and we'll look at each vacancy and see what kind of needs we have and how we might change that and that, and that happens also. As we, and then we can pull uh, people in with the, 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 the expertise we, we need. Okay, well thank you uh, very much again for a, a you know, a really very full, uh, excellent overview of uh, issues facing research libraries and some directions that are being taken. So thank you again. Thank you.